After General Allenby conquers Palestine, he sets up a military administration burdened with the task of creating a Jewish homeland there, despite the strong opposition of Arab nationalists. In Iraq, Muslim nationalists declare the independence of the Baghdad and Basra provinces, with Faisal's brother, Abdullah, as their king. British interests focus on Mosul with its rich oil reserves. Although it's mainly populated by Kurds, London works on a plan to make it part of the Iraqi nation. Complicating the matter further is the fact that most of the two million Muslims in the region belong to the Shia sect. One British expert, Arnold Wilson, warns that the Shias will never accept domination by the minority Sunni Muslims. Gertrude Bell, another Arab expert, works on a plan to unify the fragmented Muslim cultures of Iraq into a single Iraqi nation. An American missionary warns her, You are flying in the face of four millenniums of history. If you try to draw a line around Iraq and call it a political entity. By the spring of 1920, Arab raiding parties infest the Iraqi desert, taking British troops hostage and killing them. By mid-August, the Arab rebels declare a provisional government. The Times of London questions the wisdom of spending millions of pounds in Iraq and Iran in support of what it calls the foolish policy of the government in the Middle East. Churchill's number one priority was to save money, because he didn't have very much, and to have a strategy which used very little manpower, because he didn't have big armies. And that came first, ahead of everything else. He did not approach the Middle East with an ideological bent. He approached it with a very practical bent. This had been his job. He stood a good chance of succeeding to be prime minister someday, soon, if he did have made a success of this job. And that's what he was, what he was there to, um, to, uh, to do. In neighboring Iran, Central authority has broken down from British, Russian, and Turkish military operations during the war, as well as German political intrigue. In London, Lord Curzon searches for a way to remove British troops from the region and turn the chaotic territory into a self-supporting nation that can defend itself. But Iran looks elsewhere for support. In February 1921, a new government takes over in Tehran. It denounces the British treaty and signs a new one with the Soviet government in Moscow. Iran is depending on the Russians to help them eliminate the British presence. By the end of 1920, nationalist Arabs are rioting in Egypt and Palestine. King Saud of Arabia and Prince Faisal are fighting the British and French with their own armies. Sentiment grows in London that Great Britain should withdraw from the Middle East entirely. The British Foreign Office believes that the new Soviet regime in Moscow is behind much of the unrest. But it is really Great Britain and France, two Western countries trying to impose their rule on a predominantly Muslim world. In early 1921, Churchill takes charge of the government's Middle Eastern policy as colonial secretary. The Arabs want Palestine, but leaders of the Jewish Zionist movement are encouraging Jews around the world to resettle there. Arab landowners fear that they will be pushed out of their land. The Zionists point to the Balfour Declaration of 1917 as a justification from the British government itself for a Jewish homeland in Palestine. In July of 1922, Churchill argues before the House of Commons that Britain must accept a mandate over Palestine from the League of Nations. The measure is adopted, and Britain is committed to ensuring the security of a Jewish homeland in the Middle East. <laughs>